All right, so for this week's uh, retro review, we're actually going to be talking about Popeye. Uh, Popeye is actually available uh, to actually watch on Pluto TV. It's one of their in-demand features, so it's not the, the Pluto TV. For those of you who are not you haven't used it before, or not terribly familiar, um, they have all kinds of content like classic cartoons. They have a channel totally dedicated to Doctor Who. Um, there's a channel dedicated to American Gladiators, and uh, but you can watch a lot of different things, um, and it's all uh, ad-based or ad-supported uh, content. Um, but it's interesting. A, a lot of the stuff that's available on Pluto TV, but they do have a lot of in-demand content, a lot of different films, and Popeye is actually one of those. And so when Eric and I were discussing, again, we're doing our quarantine stream special. We're looking for fun and interesting things for people to maybe check out that they don't have to pay for an extra service to enjoy. So you can actually watch Popeye for free on Pluto TV. I've actually been, uh, my wife and I actually, we watched a bunch of episodes of American Gladiators actually recently. Um, so of course, uh, Popeye, uh, just a quick summary, uh, Popeye the film, this is actually from 1980. Uh, it was interesting re-watching the film. I didn't realize this was a Paramount and a Walt Disney Pictures co-production. Um, that was a bit of an eye-opener. <laughs> but this film is from 1980. The basic summary is that the adventures of the famous sailor man and his friends in the seaside town of Sweet Haven. Um, of course, this is based on a lot of people may not realize, but it was actually called Thumble Theater, which was created by E.C. Seeger. E.C. Seeger was a very influential and uh, uh, popular our cartoonist back in the day. He influenced a lot of people, such as, ironically enough, or not ironically enough, Will Eisner. Um, so this film was directed by uh, Robert Altman. Of course, it stars Robin Williams, Shelley Duvall, uh, Ray Walston. Uh, Paul Dooley, uh, Paul Smith, who I always think of as the Beast Raban from Dune. Um, just a really wonderful cast, a very interesting film. It still freaks me out that uh, Robert Altman is actually the one who directed this. Um, it is a bit of a musical time. They have a lot of musical numbers. Um, and to me, anyway, this is one of Robin Williams' more memorable uh, performances in such an amazing career. And he had so many memorable performances. Uh, but this one still sticks out to me. So usually with the retro review, we start off by talking about how did we first hear about the film Popeye? So tell me, Eric, how did you first hear about the film Popeye? It's hard to remember. When this film came out, I was very young. So I did not see it in the movie theater. Although I did see Empire Strikes Back, which came out in the same year. I did see that in the movie theater as a, little, as a small child, and I was terrified. That's why I always remember that. But uh, I didn't see Popeye in the theater. And I was trying to remember if we saw it on TV for the first time or if we rented it. And I feel like we rented it. And I feel like that's because, uh, you know, my father uh, would have been familiar with the, with the character Popeye as well. And he was always a, a big influence for me in terms of, of the, the types of things that I tended to gravitate towards. We talked about Star Trek, things like that, even Star Wars. I mean, he was the one who took me to go see The Empire Strikes Back, took the entire family. Um, so I'm thinking that we might have rented it, um, but I know w whenever whenever I saw it, I was very, very young because I, I didn't realize how much of this film I'd actually forgotten and had, you know, I had no idea about, like, it, it was almost like watching a new film to me. Uh, there's things that I, like, invented in my head that never happened, um, <laughs> you know, that, that they're not in this movie. Uh, there's things in this movie that I totally didn't see coming because I didn't remember them at all. So all I can tell you was I was very, very young the first time I saw this. And oddly enough, the one thing that always stuck in my head and that was so vivid when I was watching it now was the horse race. I always remember the gimmick that the horse races, the, the horses were mechanical. They weren't real horses. That's the one thing that I had right about this movie from my childhood. Well, that's very interesting. Um, so I, I know that um, I, I saw this film with my mom. We did see it in the movie theater. I remember that she specifically uh, wanted us to go see it. And I remember that we had to drive to a theater that we normally didn't go to because I remember it was, seemed like it was a long car ride. 
to get to the theater to see Popeye, but we did actually see it in the movie theater. Um, I had loved the cartoons, obviously, as a kid. I think there's a whole generation of, of kids who probably never even seen the Popeye cartoons, but they were a staple of, of my youth growing up. Um, and so I was quite familiar with the character from that. I didn't realize the lineage of the character that actually goes back actually to the, the comic strip um, because it just wasn't something that was, uh, I think, very prevalent at the time. It seemed like Popeye was more a character of animation, um, yeah. necessarily the comic strip. Um, and, uh, but I, I do remember, uh, going and seeing the film, um, and being mesmerized by it and at times oddly horrified by it, uh, <laughs> because it's so, it's weird because at times it, it totally captures the vibe and the feel, um, and visually at times the kind of the style of the, uh, the original, you know, animated cartoons, but at the same point, because it's live action, it's very slightly disturbing. Um, and then additionally, too, some of the musical numbers, because I, I remember just as a kid being horrified because I just don't associate Popeye with musical, you know. Um, so the, the musical numbers kind of threw me off as a child as well. Um, but I do. And by remember, the way, by the way, Dave, I did not realize this was a musical. That's how clouded my <laughs> my childhood version of this film is. I didn't know it was a musical until I I, I watched it today. So, and I did see it as a kid. I know I did. So, yeah. Well, I just that was one of the most uh, vivid memories for me is is the fact that it that it was a musical because I was very you know kind of taken aback by that. Um, you know, and then uh, they kind of take their time leading up to Popeye eating the spinach and kind of getting the extra oomph for power or whatever he needs to, of course, defeat the villain as you go throughout um, the story. And it's interesting, too, because the movie very much um, is uh, a celebration of all the characters within kind of like the Popeye universe to an extent. There's a few that are not represented, but... Um, they spent a lot of time uh, introducing all these varied characters and personalities um, in the film, um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and it is very, I, I find it as... I By the way, maybe a little too much time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe true. a little, little, little too much time. Right, right. Um, but, but I do find the film uh, entertaining um, uh, still to this day. I think I end up watching this probably about uh, about every other year, or uh, it seems like it's a pretty regularly that I watch it. And it's interesting because this film, in my mind, occupies that same time period where uh, we have a comment here. Uh, Man of Sin says Robin Williams was quite musically talented. Well, Robin Williams is all kinds of talented in my mind. Um, when you look at him playing Popeye and, and embodying that character so well in this film, and then you turn around and you see things like you know, his stand up or you, t you see him in Good Bill Hunting or I mean, he was so uh, talented um, and such a tremendous performer and entertainer. Um, he was always, always very entertaining. Um, and I, I feel like he's one of those uh, those those entertainers that, that's greatly missed um, since he's uh, no longer with us. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, by the way, uh, Dead Poets is the one for me for Robin Williams, for sure. I'd love to talk about that on the show sometime. Uh, Dead Poets Society. I, I love that film. And of course, it's a dramatic turn for Robin Williams. So yes, he was a, a ta an amazingly talented actor. Yes, I definitely agree. And then we got another comment here. Uh, James says, after seeing The Shining, it was really hard to embrace Shelley as olive oil. <laughs> I, I could see that because it's funny because... <laughs> When I think of Shelley Duvall, I only think of her as either being in The Shining or Popeye. And those are <laughs> drastically different things. Um, so, yeah, I could definitely agree with that. Um, but she, she does make a perfect olive oil, in my opinion. That's the one thing I'll say is like, as far as casting and everything in this movie, um, I, I would say even better than Robin Williams is Popeye as Shelley Duvall as, as olive oil. Yeah, I'd have to say they did. I think they did a good job casting all the way around throughout this film. Everyone visually seems to be right, um, and then their their portrayal of the characters are all on point. 
Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I take this film and, and I, I, it, and my, cause I do own this film besides having watched them through the TV. I do own it on DVD and it sits on the same portion of my DVD collection as, uh, as Dick Tracy, because when, when I think of this film, I think that they tried very hard to actually adapt Popeye, you know, like for good, for bad, you know, they, they just went for it. You know, they didn't spend a lot of time trying to sanitize or, or, you know, put it in a, a different package, you know what I mean? Or, or spend a lot Other of than the musical thing. You got, well, you, you know, got to call that out because well, yeah. you're right. I even thought that as I was watching it, you're right. It, it has a very cartoony style. The physics are very cartoon, but the musical aspect is, is definitely not very true to at least the, the shorts and the cartoons that I remember. Yeah, that's true. But I was talking just about in terms of like visually and the mechanics and, and they don't really try to update the setting very much. They, it, it very much lives kind of in that same place. Um, so for me, and like I said, again, this, this is just my opinion in my mind. I put on that same shelf as Dick Tracy with it was the same thing with Dick Tracy. They tried very much to adapt it and, and keep it true to what it was. Um, whether it needed to, you know, it, whether elements needed to be addressed or updated or not, they just rolled it right out. You know, they, they used a limited color palette to have it try and reflect, you know, the printing limitations at the time when Dick Tracy was created. Um, so it just, it's, it, in my mind, it, it, it goes on that same shelf. And, and this film is an interesting oddity too, because this film came out in the success of Superman, the movie. Um, Superman the movie uh, was uh, a huge box office success and a lot of people, a lot of different studios and producers ran around and they were trying to find other things that that could hit as big as, as Superman. So it's interesting in the wake of Superman, we got things like Doc Savage, uh, Man of Bronze with uh, Ron Eli, you know, you got Robin Williams as Popeye and you also got, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Darn it, the chick from Blue Lagoon. I can't. I, Brooke Shields, uh, who actually played, um, darn it, now I can't remember it. Now I love to pick on this movie too, and the name just escaped me. So you, you just you just got by the skin, skinnier uh, nose there. But anyhow, well, what's interesting is th th this really kind of represents that first era of 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 comic movies, and I say comic movies because I feel like the studios didn't understand the difference between a comic strip and a comic book. Because this comes out of the same era, like you said, of Superman, but also uh, Little Orphan Annie. In fact, my understanding is that this film was greenlit specifically because uh, Little Orphan Annie was being made by another studio. And Paramount said, well, what do we got? What do we got that we could do like a, like a, like a comic musical like that? And they said, well, we, we own the rights to Popeye. And that's how that came about. Had you heard that story, Dave? I, yeah, I was familiar with that, and and James got it in the comments right there. Brenda Starr, that was what I was trying to think of. Brenda Starr, um, the the it, it's weird because Eric's right because when I, in my mind I think of these as that first salvo um, of all these different things, and it did seem like the studios were confused between what was a, a, a popular, successful comic book that would make an interesting follow up to Superman versus you know just comic strips, and I had heard that. <laughs> And there's a lot of interesting stories that surround this film, too, um, in regards to the budget and the fact that they actually built uh, Sweet Haven actually on the side. I forget what it is, like a side of a cliff somewhere. And then I, I remember hearing a story that there was a, um, uh, some kind of a, a hurricane or whatever it was, and part of the sets were destroyed. And there's all these crazy stories and myth and legends that, that surround uh, this particular film. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting things that came up in my research too, is, you know, that set is still in existence because this was shot in Malta and now it's a, a amusement park. Did you know that Dave, the, 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 the set, you know, they built like this real little city for, the, for this movie and it still exists today. And it's basically a theme park in Malta. I had no idea. That's very interesting. Because I, I know that they spent a ton of money actually uh, building the set for Sweet Haven. And a lot of it was was very practical. And, and, and I think if I remember correctly, 
there were some issues where I think they had to build things to last because they were concerned about the weather and and this and where it was, which is interesting because Malta is the site for a lot of uh, films. Um, what one of my films actually, The Count of Monte Cristo, um, of course, was filmed. Uh, had scenes filmed in Malta. Well, very cool. Um, so um, as usual with the uh, retro retrospective, what we want to do is we want to talk about uh, how we first uh, heard about the film. So we talked about that. Then we want to, uh, of course, revisit the film and talk about how we feel about the film today, having just recently um, rewatched it actually on Pluto TV. So tell me, Eric, how do you feel about Popeye today? Having, having just recently rewatched it, you did talk about it, didn't really fit your memories of the film as when you were <laughs> seen it when you were younger, but how do you feel about Popeye today? Well, this is not a unique experience. I've, I've had this experience before where I watch either a animated show or a movie from my childhood. And I remember it completely different than the way it actually was. Like I said, I didn't even, I wasn't prepared for the fact that this was a musical. That really shocked me as soon as I saw that and everybody was singing and it, it was actually very, um, this jarring for me, you know, I, I was actually kind of discombobulated for a while and like, what am I watching here? Uh, Cause it's just not the way I remembered it. It's also very long. Uh, this is like a two hour long uh, musical comedy, uh, which I, I, I think is a kind of an odd choice. I mean, I think that there was a lot of odd choices in this film, to be honest with you. Um, it, it, I don't know. I don't think it's, ugh. how do I say this? It's a very unique film. So just just for that reason alone, I think it's 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 worth a watch, um, but I don't know how how much it translates to a modern audience. I, I don't know how how a modern audience really feels about this. Uh, in my research, ironically, I found out that Siskel and Ebert both gave it two big thumbs up. Uh, they both loved it. Uh, Leonard Malton hated it and said that it was a terrible movie and just stick with the cartoons. Um, and I guess maybe I'm in the middle of that somewhere. Uh, I didn't hate it, but but it, it it was it was it was jarring for me simply because my memory of it as a kid is so different than what the movie actually is. So I was like kind of shocked, and I kind of still am. Well, the the musical aspect of it definitely makes it its own unique production, and and definitely sets it apart from definitely the cartoons that a lot of us grew up watching. Um, I personally and I prefer the cartoons. I'll say that. I prefer the cartoons. Yeah, and I would say I prefer the cartoons too, but that at the same point, um, I feel like again that this of these films that came out during this era, there, there's you know a couple of them that I think are worth kind of you know revisiting from time to time and remembering because of a microcosm of of kind of the spirit of creativity that existed. You know, Annie is a classic film in my mind, you know, um, and of course that, you know, of course, Little Orphan Annie. Um, and, and I would put, you know, Popeye's not as good a film as Annie. I think Annie's a better film. But um, I do I do think this film uh, occupies an interesting place. And I do think it's always worth discussing when you talk about these early adaptations of comic strips and comic book movies, because um, at times it's it's very much on point. And at times it's completely way off topic and, and doing something that, that's, that doesn't quite make sense um, when you think about, you know, if you look at it from the standpoint of, you know, just the cartoons themselves. But I, but I do think that's also the same point. Just like, you know, reading Gold Key Star Trek comics is kind of fun because of how wildly inconsistent they are at times. Because the spirit of Popeye is so close and so faithful, even though they do venture off into the wild woods and you're like, why are we doing a musical all of a sudden? Um, it, it still <laughs> kind of, it gives it a weird quaint kind of charm in a weird way. I think that's why it's still kind of oddly remembered for some people is because the musical aspect of it makes it so unusual because I never see many people talk about, you know, doc, uh, doc Savage man of bronze, you know um, there's a small cult following for it. Um, but there's these other productions that you never hear really remembered. And I think the musical is 
it, well, Robin Williams, of course, too, um, is part of the reason that's you know wildly remembered and, and fondly remembered as well. Um, but um, I think that's what gives it kind of its interesting kind of zing, because that's the thing about it that I always kind of find kind of interesting. Um, were you aware but, that apparently most of the singing was actually uh, filmed live? Were you aware of that? Which is another reason that it has sort of a, a very odd sound to it. In fact, I would say it's a very unpolished sound to, to be kind, but uh, it was recorded live. Were you aware of that? I'm not surprised. I think I had heard that once upon a time because there was it's quite a few years ago, I'd kind of delved into, I had found uh, someone had written a kind of interesting, very deep dive into this, into this uh, film um, and gotten into a lot of the different aspects of the production and I think I'd remembered reading something about that because that's the thing. There's a lot of oddities about how this film was produced. Um, and that's one of the things I think that, that makes it worth actually remembering in a weird way. That's what I'm talking about, the good and the bad. Um, and then uh, Jaina has a comment here. She says, I like that they stayed so true to Popeye's character. And, and I did too. I did too. That's what I'm saying. That's one of the things I think that makes the film as a... a as a fan, that's one of the things I like about it, even though it does do these musical numbers and it kind of ventures and does some strange things from time to time. The fact that they do stay so faithful with the characters, I think is what kind of gives it that sort of like permission to kind of, you know, take a couple risks. You know, if they just changed everything or changed more than, you know, changed a lot of it and then also had it be a musical, I think it'd just be considered a travesty, you know, cause it, it, it would have gone too far. Um, but no, it, it's, I think it's an interesting film. I think it's definitely worth revisiting. I, I mean, for myself, um, again, like I said, I, I always seem to be rewatching this about every year or two. Um, and I always, I always kind of enjoy it. And, uh, I have a small circle of friends, um, within the industry. And there's these certain films that we're always kind of talking about and revisiting because of how strange or how unusual, or how unique <laughs> we think they are. You know, Popeye is one of those films that comes up in those conversation, even though it has it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it seems always seems like Popeye, Black Hole, and Tron are always coming up in the same sort of weird conversation about these films that we like that sometimes we don't quite understand why, um, but we just enjoy them. I, I would say, by the way, of that list, I would put Popeye at the bottom of, of that list because I think Tron and Black Hole are better films. I I, I would just I would just put that caveat out there myself personally. <laughs> well, I, I understand it. I, it. It's just, it's one of those films. Like I said, I have this small circle of friends and, and this is one of those films that, that often gets discussed. And I think the reason it's discussed is because at times it's so faithful and other times it's so wildly unfaithful. You know, it's kind of like black hole. One of the things that's really interesting about black hole is it's, it's such an interesting, you know, Disney riff on Star Wars, but then you get to the end of the film and there's all these questions. You know, some people still say the film doesn't have an ending. I say the film has a very definitive ending, you know, but other people say it doesn't really have one because they didn't know how to resolve the, the story. Um, so um, it, it, that's what I'm saying. It's just, it's interesting that it, it, it's still being talked about to this day, at least among my circle of friends, because it, I think the musical aspect of it is what helps it kind of give it a little bit more longevity because it, it's a very head scratching thing when it starts, when they start singing. <laughs> that was, that was my reaction. That was, <laughs> I was like, Whoa, okay. Yeah. I didn't remember that. I really didn't. So again, it was a bit jarring for me. It's just not the way I remembered the film, but I always remember is the arms. You can see it in the picture that you have up too. <laughs> it's the big Popeye yeah. arm. So, I, I were uh, the um, I the I think this the the things that always stick with me that I always remember from this film specifically is you know talking about the the arms do do stick out in my mind too. But it was that scene where he's fighting the guys. I can't remember if it was in the gambling hall or where it was, but where he's doing the. Uh, when they do the speed bag and he's doing the speed bag with the one yeah. guy <laughs> that very vividly, because that was a very Popeye kind of thing from like the cartoon, that whole little yeah. bit. 
Um, and then I was, Chris, I, at the end of the film, I remember the, the battle with the octopus because that was very much a live action, you know, cartoon Popeye kind of moment. Those are the ones that always definitely stuck with me as a kid. Very classic Popeye kind of stuff with him sailing through the water in the Superman fist pose and hitting the um, octopus and everything. So, um, and that's what I'm talking about. It like, This film has moments where it's so wildly and wonderfully accurate you know, and then, and then the musical stuff is so kind of slightly like, what, what are they doing? Why are they singing? You know? <laughs> um, but, so, but I think that's yep. what makes it a curiosity. I think that's what I'm saying. I think, so, I think that's what makes it interesting and makes it a curiosity. So. Yeah, I agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Cool. All right. So um, do we think that's good for this episode? Uh, yeah, I think so. 